The anatomy of the human eye, so intricate, so beautifully designed, so incredibly effective. Compare it to the design of the camera, and the similarities are truly remarkable. The camera is the device we use to capture our visions in permanent form. So it's not surprising that our camera communicates that vision according to the original master plan, the eye itself. The round eyeball and the box-like camera may not look much alike, but both are light, tight containers that protect their internal parts. The walls of the eyeball keep surrounding light from interfering with the image seen by the eye, while the walls of the camera prevent extraneous light from leaking inside and fogging the film. The eyelid serves two important functions, and both have parallels in photography. First, it protects the eyeball just as a lens cap protects the surface of a camera lens. The eyelid also acts like a camera shutter. When the eyelid opens and closes, it affects how much light enters the eye. The shutter of a camera also opens and closes, controlling the quantity of light entering the camera. Light first passes through the cornea and lens of the eye before an image can be seen. The lens actually changes shape as the eye focuses on objects at varying distances. In a camera, you adjust the focus by rotating the lens focus ring, which varies the distance between the lens and the film plane. The close correlation between the eye and the camera is evident when comparing the iris of the eye and the diaphragm of the lens. Both form round holes that can be adjusted to control the amount of light that passes through the lens. But there's no picture at all, either when looking at something or when shooting a camera, unless that light is absorbed. What we need is a light-sensitive surface. In the eye, the retina receives the light, and by sending messages to the brain via the optic nerve, creates the miracle of sight. In the camera, photographic film is the counterpart to the retina. The film is coated on one side with an emulsion that's light sensitive. This emulsion side of the film is held in a plane facing the camera lens. When light reaches the film, the emulsion permanently records the image and another form of sight is achieved. The camera is essentially an extension of our ability to see. It enhances our vision just as a tool extends the capabilities of our hand. The 35 millimeter single lens reflex camera, or SLR, is the most flexible camera ever conceived and the most popular. The SLR is so designed that you can respond to your subject quickly and easily without the bulkiness of a larger format camera. The 35 millimeter single lens reflex camera, that's the type we'll use to become creative photographers. To use your camera effectively, you should be totally familiar with it. Your goal is to become so proficient with its controls and features that you don't even need to think. Now, let's identify the various parts and understand how they can contribute to our pleasure and skill. The body of the camera contains three chambers for holding the film, while the back pivots open for changing the film. The chamber on the left accepts the fresh film roll. The central chamber is the space where the image is created during exposure and the chamber on the right contains the take-up spool for exposed film. Film guide rails are positioned above and below the central chamber to hold the film firmly in a flat plane. Each camera functions somewhat differently, so do read your instruction manual thoroughly. However, one key point, be sure that both the upper and lower sprockets of the film are snugly engaged on the take-up roller before you close the camera back. Advance the film for two or three exposures, or until your film counter registers at number one. As you are doing this, check to see that the top of the rewind knob is turning. This confirms that the film is advancing properly inside the camera. After you've completely shot a roll, rewind it by first activating the rewind button that's found on the bottom of most cameras. This disengages the advanced sprocket so you can rewind the film back into its cassette. A focal plane shutter is common on most SLRs. 
This type of shutter consists of two overlapping curtains that form a slit that moves horizontally in front of the film plane. The speed of the shutter is adjusted by turning its control knob. Various numbers on the knob represent different shutter speeds. There are some letters, too. B stands for bulb, a term of photographic antiquity. The bulb position opens the shutter for as long as you hold down the release button. The colored number, X or flash symbol, designates the highest speed that properly synchronizes with electronic flash. And the A stands for automatic operation in cameras which feature an automatic exposure mode. Shutter action begins when you press the release button on top of the camera. A locking device is generally located nearby. By design, the 35 millimeter single lens reflex camera lets you look right through the camera lens itself. You see exactly what the camera sees. A five-sided prism turns the image right side up so that a normal image appears through the viewfinder. A mirror reflects the light up to a focusing screen and this same mirror quickly moves up and out of the way when an exposure is made. A built-in through the lens metering system is part of virtually every modern single lens reflex camera. One or more light sensitive cells are located either in the prism or on the floor of the central chamber. Use the ASA ISO index to set the light meter to the speed of your film. This index is often combined as a separate function within the shutter speed control knob. The flexibility of interchangeable lenses is one of the many advantages of 35 millimeter cameras. A button adjacent to the lens mount releases a locking device that holds the lens securely in place. Consult your instruction materials for this detailed information. Different cameras offer various optional controls, such as the depth of field preview button. Pressing it closes the lens diaphragm down to the aperture setting or lens opening you've selected. There's also the reflex mirror lockup lever, which lifts the reflex mirror and locks it in a raised position, blocking off the viewing system for special applications. A self-timer provides a delayed shutter release of about 10 seconds once the timing device is cocked. Enough time for the picture taker to become part of the picture. And finally, the hot shoe accommodates accessories, particularly the small portable electronic flash units which attach both mechanically and electronically in a single motion. The camera lens determines photographic quality and it controls two of the three primary adjustments of the camera, the focus, and the lens opening or aperture setting. Since lenses are interchangeable, you can adapt your camera to a wide variety of opportunities and conditions. Almost all lenses have the same basic component parts. They are complex structures held together by a lens barrel. Inside the barrel are geometrically shaped glass elements, from three or four elements in simple basic lenses, up to 15 or more in complex and zoom lenses. Engraved at the top of the lens barrel is the focus indicator. This is the mark in the center of the depth of field scale. As you turn the focusing ring, the entire lens moves, bringing it in and out from the film plane. A scale on the focusing ring reads distances in feet and meters. When looking through the viewfinder, subjects are in focus when they fall within the plane of critical focus, and anything either closer or farther away is blurred. Aperture control, is the second dimension of the lens adjustment. It serves two functions. Like a water faucet, it controls the flow of light through the lens. Remember the larger the f-stop number, the smaller the hole formed by the diaphragm. f11 lets in less light than f5.6. Now f-stop is a new photographic term. Press the still step button and hold the frame while consulting the definition section of the accompanying manual for a detailed description. Aperture size also affects how much of the image will be in focus. The smaller the aperture, the greater the depth of field, which means that a greater depth of area is in focus in front of and behind your principal subject. You can easily predict how much of your image will be in focus by looking at the relationship between the depth of field scale and the distance scale. For example, on a 50 millimeter lens with an aperture setting of F11 focused at 10 feet, your plane of critical focus would fall within a range of from 7 feet to 15 feet. A normal lens of approximately 50 millimeter focal length is usually supplied with most cameras. It's called normal because perspective and subject size relationships are shown naturally. Telephoto lenses or long lenses compress the effective distance. 
shooting with a 200 millimeter lens, trees that are far away still appear to be as large as those in the foreground. The longer the focal length of a telephoto, the more pronounced is this compression effect. A telephoto will also magnify any movement of either the subject or the camera. So higher shutter speeds or use of a tripod is recommended. In contrast, a wide angle lens expands the impression of space. It exaggerates and even distorts relationships between size and distance. Small objects close to the wide angle lens appear larger than bigger objects farther away. The rendering of perspective is also enhanced with wide angle lenses. And if you tilt the camera up or down, parallel vertical lines are distorted. Zoom lenses take on the same characteristics as any particular single focal length lens you choose. Look at zoom as almost an infinite assortment of fixed focal length lenses, all in one housing. One feature that's unique to a zoom lens is the effect of concentric streaking, which is created by rapidly changing the focal length during exposure. Other than for streaking effect and focal length adjustment, the controls on a zoom lens are used in much the same way as single focal length lenses. Special purpose lenses provide widely extended capabilities and many unique functions, but they also demand your particular attention. With macro lenses, you must deal with a shallow depth of field and greater sensitivity to movement, the very same precautions required for telephoto lenses. Fisheye lenses distort reality to consciously create an effect. Modern soft focus lenses are relatively easy to handle, but you'll find they respond to conditions like contrast and backlighting much differently than conventional lenses, often producing beautiful and dramatic results. One of the very first questions we all face is which film shall I use? How can I make the right choice from so many options? First, consider the kind of end product you wish to achieve. Black and white film produces negatives which are used to make black and white prints. Color negative film produces color negatives for color prints. And color slide film will give you slides for projection. There are also many secondary options. Color slides can be used to make fine color prints. Less well known is the use of color negatives to make color slides. And black and white negatives can also be used to make black and white slides. Your choice of film doesn't always have to be dictated by your end requirements. Perhaps you only want a few large prints. Then choose color slide film, since it's cheaper to buy and process compared to a similarly sized roll of color negative film where you pay for both the processing and the print costs on each picture. Another consideration is the speed of the film. Film speed is the measure of sensitivity of that particular film to light and is expressed in a standard progression of ASA or ISO numbers. As the numbers go higher, the film sensitivity increases. Each doubling of the ASA number indicates that the film is twice as sensitive to light. There are three broad categories of film speed, slow, medium, and fast. Slow films are rated from 20 through 80, medium speeds from 100 through 200, and fast or high-speed films from 250 through 400. Color temperature defines the two types of color film. The blue of daylight is balanced for 5,500 degrees Kelvin. The warmer tungsten light is balanced for 3,200 or 3,400 degrees Kelvin. Most color negative films may be used with tungsten light even though they're balanced for daylight. The color balance can then be corrected to a reasonable degree in printing. General purpose black and white films can be used under all lighting conditions, irrespective of light source or color temperature. Within each film type, there are different brands from which to choose, and the final selection becomes a matter of personal taste and the availability of film and processing in your area. Above all, there are two measurable image qualities important in any film selection. One is resolution, which is simply the ability of the film to record and define an image in detail. The other is grain, the relative size of the individual silver granules that form the sensitive light absorbing portion of the film emulsion. Grain is the apparent texture and pattern of a photographic image. Light is the language of photography, one of the richest variables under your control. It will give your subject form and texture and create the mood to tell your story. 
Daylight's infinite variations provide you with many options, limited only by your patience and sensitivity. Natural light changes continually with the time of day, weather, and season. There's little you can actively do to change the effect of daylight, but you can choose the time to photograph. You can also carefully determine the position of your camera, taking into account the direction the light is coming from and how that light falls upon and illuminates your subject. Electronic flash permits you to shoot when natural illumination is too low, but as with anything artificial, there are compromises. Most flash units that attach to your camera have limited power or light output. The light level falls off rapidly with distance, and this restricts the subject to camera proximity. Photo floods and quartz halogen lights supply continuous illumination. In comparison to flash, continuous lighting can be visualized and actively controlled. You can knowingly place the lights wherever you need them in relation to a subject, creating the most effective direction of light. And by using multiple lights, you can easily mold the relationship of highlights and shadows. Remember that photo floods do call for tungsten-type color film, slow shutter speeds, and, of course, the use of a tripod. Acceptable, often stunning images can be achieved whatever the light source. But as a general rule, use indoor-type film with ordinary household light, even though it results in a warmer picture. Conversely, daylight-type films work best with fluorescent or neon lighting. The hardness or softness of light dramatically affects how the subject is rendered. In natural settings, direct sunlight produces hard light, while an overcast sky, fog, or the indirect light of open shade illuminates subjects softly. Hard light creates distinct shadows, more contrast, greater texture, and stronger form and color. Let's look at light direction. Front light creates a very flat, two-dimensional subject. Its definition is totally dependent upon color and tone. When light is added from above, three-dimensional modeling begins to take place. As the main light source moves away from the camera toward the side position, there is a dramatic change in form and contrast. Backlight usually produces the strongest subject contrast, clearly separating subjects from their backgrounds. Try assigning yourself a photographic project. One subject with one lens and one type of light. Then vary the direction of light until you run out of ideas. Exposure is a key variable necessary to the creative control of photographic imaging. Exposure control is based on a very simple principle. Increasing the exposure level results in a lighter image. Decreasing exposure results in a darker image. With a manual SLR or an automatic camera operating in manual mode, exposure is controlled by either changing the aperture setting or the shutter speed. In automatic mode, you simply adjust the exposure compensation control. Individual circumstances will determine how you adjust exposure, whether you change the aperture setting or the shutter speed. If you need more exposure and the depth of field is critical, selecting a slower shutter speed is best. If your subject movement requires a faster shutter speed, get more exposure by using a larger aperture setting. With aperture priority automatic cameras, Keep in mind that shutter speed is changed automatically when you adjust exposure. And with shutter priority, the opposite occurs. The lens diaphragm opening is altered. Internal camera metering systems respond to all subjects as if they were a flat gray tone. Knowing this, you can identify subjects that might mislead the meter. Look at it this way. Try photographing the side of a white house with an exposure based on the camera meter reading. The house will be reproduced in middle gray tones rather than white. At the other extreme, try shooting a black cat against a dark background. Your camera meter will indicate an exposure that produces a medium gray cat. Now, here's a simple technique to prevent your camera meter from ever changing the color of your cat. Carry a Kodak 18% gray card with you. Focus on the card, 
fill the frame and take a precise meter reading. This simple foolproof procedure guarantees accurate exposures when your subject is very light, very dark, if your background is much lighter than your subject or much darker than your subject. Bracketing helps to achieve just the right exposure interpretation. Simply take several shots of each scene, varying the exposure in both directions by increments of one third, one half, or a full stop, thus slightly under and overexposing your subject. Try selecting several different kinds of subjects and see how bracketing exposures extends your control over the final result. Camera accessories enlarge your picture-taking capabilities. Some offer convenience, others fill a critical need. Hands-on experience is the best way to determine your continuing requirements. A camera case protects and organizes your equipment. The molded cases frequently sold with cameras are ideal when you use the camera alone or with just a few other items. Some photographers prefer soft, flexible, sectionalized bags, which allow for expansion as new equipment is acquired. A fitted hard case seems to be the most practical for people working with full systems. A thin neck strap is supplied with your camera, and it's just not as comfortable as the popular wide straps. But thin straps can easily be shortened to create a tight, rigid brace between the hands, body, and camera for steadier shooting. A lens shade protects the lens from extraneous light. It eliminates the unwanted reflections from bouncing off internal lens surfaces, which result in flare and a degrading of the image. It also protects the front element from accidental damage. Choose modular shades for their convenience and economy when planning to use filters and other lens attachments. Tripods are a must for both long exposures and long or telephoto lenses. When shooting sports or wildlife, you can level the tripod and pan with the action. Neck straps or a rope can add extra stability on windy days. Try cutting down an old tripod to make a low boy, or mount a tripod head on a triangular piece of plywood. A cable release is usually used with any tripod to eliminate accidental transfer of body movement to the camera when the shutter is released. Some subjects and lighting conditions can mislead the built-in light meter. So you'll find reassurance and value in owning a handheld exposure meter to give you a precise exposure setting. Incident meters take an average reading of light falling on the subject, much like using a gray card. Spot meters read light reflected from the subject. They're particularly useful in determining exposure on distant subjects and in evaluating subject contrast. Motorized film advancing is a great help when shooting action photography. It lets you concentrate completely on following the subject with the camera. Even if you don't do much action shooting, you still might experiment with a motor winder or motor drive. Some people find that the motor's added bulk and weight increases the stability of a handheld camera. Photographing people is an involving experience, and you will use a combination of many of your newly acquired skills. But above all, it demands a close, almost intimate collaboration between you and your subject. You have the responsibility for making your subject comfortable, interested, and interesting. Once your subject becomes a partner in the project, useful ideas will flow both ways. Most successful photographers go to great lengths to achieve a close rapport which produces memorable pictures. The informal outdoor portrait is an easy, relaxed way to begin. The ingredients are simple. Your camera, tripod, lens shade, and of course, some film. First, pick an interesting location that offers some open shade areas with flattering light. Move around to avoid direct sunlight. Many times, just a few steps can make the difference between unattractive and beautiful lighting. Look for areas that provide a warm, colored bounce light. Avoid large, open vistas of green grass, trees, or sky, because they alter skin tones, shifting them slightly off color. The use of a tripod allows you the freedom to move between the camera and the subject, and it gives you the opportunity to study the relationship between your subject and the background. A slightly long lens 
an 85 to 135 millimeter, is ideal for both limiting any distortion in the face and for moving the background to a support position, out of focus. A medium speed film and an aperture of 5.6 or 6.3 might give the best results to start with. Protect your lens from flare. Now, here's a new assignment. Find a model who will help you select different settings for an entire day of shooting. A commitment to an entire day will guarantee a variety of challenging lighting conditions. Have your model move around until the light looks just right. Use the same lens and type of film for all the photos you'll take that day. And don't forget your gray card to meter those situations with strong backlight and settings that have either very light or very dark backgrounds. Encourage your model with positive comments. Even if things don't look quite right, it's better to make an exposure than to hesitate. Don't be afraid to expend film. Many times, just a slight change of expression will result in a great portrait. It may take quite a few shots, but be supportive and take some chances. Study the prints or slides resulting from the day's shoot and eliminate the types of settings that gave you problems. Then try it all over again until you feel confident in your skills as an outdoor portrait photographer. Let's look at what happens when you use different focal length lenses on portraiture. Wide angle lenses place emphasis on the background. They're fine for creating the environmental portrait showing the relationship of a subject to elements of either their vocation or hobby. Very wide lenses, 16 to 24 millimeters, can make startling photographs in which subjects are placed in incongruous settings. You might find it easier to compose with a wide angle lens if you hand hold your camera. To avoid distortion, take great care in placing your subject within the setting or use the distortion skillfully as part of your design. Limit this kind of effect to those situations where it materially improves image comprehension. Extremely long lenses, those from 200 to 500 millimeters, offer marvelous distortion-free close-ups. Shooting portraits with such a long lens tends to make communication with your subject more difficult, but the results are often worth it. A short extension tube is helpful and necessary for focusing more closely on your subject. Use a good tripod and keep your shutter speeds faster than 1 30th of a second whenever possible. Let's build on these basic principles and consider the most spontaneous people of all, children. Everything we have discovered about photographing adults applies equally to children. They become wonderful photographic partners when we investigate things that they're interested in. Make sure the lighting is open and simple. Have your equipment ready to shoot and don't try to do too much directing. Be patient, observe, and let the pictures happen. Certain additional equipment might add versatility when you shoot people. A stand with a large white poster board makes an excellent reflector. It allows you to work in areas that don't naturally provide the warm bounce light that we've been looking for. Folding fabric reflectors are easier to carry, and they help to illuminate or fill shadow areas, too. It's possible to become quite elaborate. Notice how four reflectors are used to make this informal portrait. Tungsten lights create a whole new palette of possibilities. For with lights, you know you can shoot whenever and wherever you wish. And yet just one light, in combination with accessories or reflectors, can be used with dramatic effect. Try bouncing that light to achieve the same diffused tonality that we look for outdoors. Tracing paper or frosted plastic stretched over a lightweight frame will diffuse light and give it a broader, softer quality. Now use your reflector to fill in the shadow side. A second light will separate your subject from the background. Use it as a backlight or to light the background. Tiny accent lights bring highlights to hair and texture to men's skin. Everything that we've achieved with tungsten light can also be done with electronic flash. And the instantaneous speed of electronic flash stops action. With babies, flash is ideal, but try to shoot with your flash unit removed from the camera and continue to use diffusers and reflectors to supplement flash. Whatever type of equipment you use, the comfort and motivation of your subjects are truly the keys to fine photography. 
The challenge of sports and action photography is in the extremely limited time available to capture a shot. You'll encounter moving subjects, varying distances, and unusual light sources. Sports, news events, and theatrical performances are each unique in their demands and requirements. And you need to be prepared with suitable materials and equipment. In outdoor sports and action photography, the single most common element is subject movement. You must understand the nature of the event, because then you'll know where the action is and the focal length lens needed to capture it. It'll take very high shutter speeds to capture the peak action. Use a thousandth of a second if necessary. And be prepared to use a high speed film to ensure the appropriate combination of shutter speed and aperture setting in diminished light conditions. When your subject is moving at a 90 degree right angle to you, you can pan with the action and reduce somewhat the need for a higher shutter speed. You can follow anything from a jogger to a motorcycle with a 200 millimeter lens on a strong tripod, shooting as slowly as 125th of a second. Always stand at the camera in the position in which you will end your pan. If you want to communicate a sense of speed, try some exposures at slower shutter speeds. When the action will allow you to anticipate where your subject is going to be, pre-focus and let your subject move into that focus. When the action is fast and the light conditions are changing rapidly, an automatic camera with a winder or motor drive is recommended. The action is easier to follow and there is less chance of missing an important shot. Try an assignment in action photography where the movement is repetitive Experiment by shooting the same action over and over with various shutter speeds. Keep a written log so you can recall with precision which speed gives you the most exciting results. Indoor events require the additional consideration of color balance as well as speed. In most situations, you will get better results with high speed tungsten film. However, in some theatrical events, individual performers are illuminated by carbon arc spotlights. In this case, you'll do better with daylight film. When you need an ultra high speed film, it's possible to purposefully overdevelop or push process your film. However, do consult in advance with your professional lab. When stage lighting is contrasty, try using a very long lens to take the light reading with the internal camera meter. This is an alternative to having a spot meter. Then switch from the long lens to the appropriate lens. Never hesitate to take a picture, because many times your intuition will pay off handsomely and you'll achieve a spectacular shot. You chose photography as a permanent expression of your individual creativity. And you can share your vision by producing slideshows and display prints of travel experiences. The picture story technique is useful for organizing your shooting approach to both scenic and travel photography. Think of the picture story sequence as long shot, medium shot, close up. We're frequently attracted to a scene while walking or driving. It's the long shot that calls out to you. And that is most frequently recorded with a wide angle lens. The 28 millimeter lens has been very popular, but there are also great possibilities with even wider lenses, including the full frame fisheye. Try to sum up your total impression of the scene. Now look for foreground elements to add depth and to convey information and a palpable sense of being there. Though the wide angle lens is usually best for a long shot, it's not the only approach. Look for the lens and viewpoint that captures the essence of your subject. The medium shot requires you to step aside, take a new look. Ask yourself, how can I simplify this scene? What's extraneous? How much can I take out, not add? While normal or long lenses might seem best for medium shots, it's really impossible to generalize. 
There are no rules, only opportunities, and results are always the final arbiter. Your goal is to find the best, most simplified composition within your scene. The close-up offers a great variety of little jewel pictures that lie within every setting. Look at your feet. Consider the ground level view. Move in close. A back street in the city. A vista of meadow. A stretch of beach. All offer enough wonderful close-ups to enrich your travel story. Shoot five or six different settings using the long shot, medium shot, and close-up techniques. Capture the feeling of each location. The time of day you choose for shooting adds tone and texture to the scene. The clarity of early morning light and the warm, sensuous atmosphere of late afternoon, they both speak loudly for shooting during the extremes of the day. However, strong overhead midday light offers us an opportunity to photograph subject matter many of us overlook. Seek out scenes that are illuminated by reflected light or bounce light. Look for combinations of color and form. Find a point of view that will make an interesting abstract composition. Try night photography. You'll need a camera or handheld meter that has good low light level sensitivity and of course a tripod and cable release. Daylight film will give you more interesting color. Bracket your exposures. Filters can be very helpful in bringing an extra dimension to scenic photographs. A polarizing filter darkens blue sky, and clouds become more pronounced. A polarizer increases contrast in light scenes and gives colors more snap. Color correcting filters like the Kodak Rattan 81 series will add a bit of warmth. And the primary color filter, such as the CC15Y or 15B or 15R, can be used to shift the color balance of a scene just enough to add drama. The higher the number on a color correcting or CC filter, the greater that filter's density. High density filters force a scene into a monochromatic interpretation. Fog or diffusion filters create romantic scenes. And consider sparkle or cross star filters for those scenes that have spectral highlights. The camera sees things in ways we cannot. By selecting the right special effect, you can bring a whole new sense of wonder to familiar subjects. Pick one special effect which particularly interests you, and then shoot as many variations of it as you can discover. We've already had some experience with subject movement. An interesting variation is camera movement. Generally, an exposure of 1 15th of a second or slower results in images like these. And you can zoom during longer sequences. Double exposures require precise planning. When you purposely overlap two exposures, try underexposing each by two stops. Sandwiches are the combinations of two slides in one mount. This effect usually works best if one slide has areas of lightness. Photographers often re-photograph sandwiches onto duplicating film. You can vary the sandwich technique by introducing a light area that's out of focus in one of the slides. This provides a clear window for the second slide to be seen. There is an infinite variety of effect filters such as this diffraction screen. This filter, along with most other effect filters, are offered in numerous variations. And of course, black and white prints can be re-photographed with an added element of color. Black and white photography emphasizes form, texture, and content. It concentrates attention 
and demands the participation of the eye of the observer. The character of a community breathes through the details of its architecture. Black and white photographs guide the eye, without color distraction, to the geometry of form and the rhythm of texture. The new generation of 35 millimeter black and white films and chemistries offer substantially enhanced image quality that rivals the results previously obtainable only with larger format cameras. A successful photo assignment begins with thorough pre-shoot preparation. Select a location that enhances your concept. Pay attention to equipment needs, camera setup, and appropriate lighting conditions. Search out small imperfections that can mar a well-composed image. Look at your subject as if you were seeing it for the first time. Eliminate extraneous elements from the frame. The qualities that make this vintage car special are in the subtleties of its design. The unusual marriage of an 80 to 200 millimeter zoom lens to a bellows attachment 
gives uncommon versatility and range to close-up photography when the subject cannot be moved or easily positioned. You can rapidly adjust composition and image size. A simple hinged wooden frame covered with frosted acetate suppresses wind movement and provides a bonus of soft light diffusion. The bellows encourages extreme close-ups that usually lie outside the range of zoom lenses with macro focusing capability. and a small mirror converts the overhead sun into a directed and flexible backlight. Conventional reportage technique records an event in a context that relates action to its setting. Yet within the linear repertorial approach lie opportunities for vivid impressionistic comment. The creative camera is your photographic friend. Every variable of aperture, film, lens selection, shutter speed, light, texture, and composition is under your direct control. By skillfully blending these fundamentals, your visions can become permanent memories and your opportunity for visual self-expression unlimited. <laughs>